Welcome to the 16th lecture in the series, Introduction to New Testament Textual Criticism. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the opportunities that wait for us today to glorify you. You have already opened doors that no one can shut. Stir up our zeal, enlighten our eyes, and invigorate and guide our hands and feet, that we may express today nature you've given to your people as the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, Amen. Today's lecture is the first part of a two-part consideration of one of the most famous textual variants in the New Testament, the ending of the Gospel of Mark. The main focus today will be external evidence, but we begin with a point about internal evidence. How one answers the question, were verses 9 through 20 part of the original text, might depend on how one defines the term original text. It is sometimes assumed that the original text of a biblical document is indistinguishable from the text from the pen of the author of the book. But if that standard were applied consistently, as if one book can have one and only one author, the field of lower criticism, focused on what happened after a book's transmission history began, would rapidly blend into the field of higher criticism, focused on what happened when the book was still being prepared for circulation. For example, if Moses is considered the author of Deuteronomy, and a book can have only one human source, what, did we do, what do we do with Deuteronomy 34, 5-12, which describes the death of Moses? If Joshua is considered the author of the book of Joshua, what do we do with Joshua 24, 29-33, where the death of Joshua is mentioned? And in the book of Psalms, Moses is identified as the source of Psalm 90, but David is identified as the author of many other psalms. And other psalms, such as Psalm 137, refer to events that occurred centuries after the time of David. If we were to insist that the book of Psalms must have only one human author, a substantial number of the Psalms would need to be removed. Similarly, if the original text of the book of Proverbs were limited to the work of a single human author, the final two chapters would be jettisoned, for they are specifically identified as the words of Agur and as the words of King Lemuel, which his mother taught him. In the Hebrew text of Jeremiah, at the end of chapter 51, we find a verse that says, Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. But in our Bibles there is another chapter consisting of 34 verses resembling part of 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25. So if we ask, is the original text limited to the work of a single human author, these examples show that the answer is no. The original text is the contents of a document at the point where its production stage ended and its transmission stage began the point when copies began to be made and distributed for God's people to use. I hope to revisit this point later, but first something else ought to be pointed out that pertains to this passage. The remarkable amount of misinformation that has been spread about it. Another entire lecture could be made just pointing out commentators' mistakes regarding Mark 16, 9-20. The late Norman Geisler was one of several commentators who claimed that verses 9-20 through are lacking in many of the oldest and most reliable manuscripts. In Eugene Peterson's hyperparaphrase, The Message, a footnote still says that Mark 16, 9-20 is contained only in later manuscripts. Commentators such as N.T. Wright, Craig Evans, and James Edwards have spread a claim that in many manuscripts, Mark 16, 9-20 is accompanied by asterisk or obli to indicate that the passage is spurious. It is not uncommon to encounter Bible footnotes that say that some manuscripts of Mark in the text at 16.8 and some manuscripts in the text of Mark at 16.20. Why is the footnote phrased so vaguely? Out of about 1,640 Greek manuscripts of Mark, only three Greek manuscripts in the text at 16.8. The youngest manuscript to do so is GA 304. A medieval manuscript that is a commentary in which segments of the text of Mark are interspersed with segments of commentary that resembles the commentary of Theophylact, whose fuller commentary includes comments on verses 9-20. through 20. 
The other two are much more significant, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. These are the two earliest manuscripts of Mark 16. Vaticanus was made in about 325, and Sinaiticus was made in about 350, probably in the city of Caesarea. There were some unusual aspects of the testimony of both of these manuscripts regarding the ending of Mark. Although Codex Vaticanus' text of Mark stops at 16.8, followed by the closing title, instead of beginning the following column with the text of Luke, the copyist of Codex Vaticanus left the third column on this page blank. This is the only blank column that was left in Codex Vaticanus throughout the entire New Testament. Codex Vaticanus has three blank columns in its Old Testament portion, and Dan Walls wrote that the reasons for these gaps are anything but clear. But the causes of those three blank spaces are easy to see. The blank space between 2nd Esdras and Psalms occurs because the format of the page changes. The text in 2nd Esdras is written in three columns per page. The text in Psalms is written in two columns per page. The blank space between Tobit and Hosea occurs because at this point, one copyist work ends and the other copyist work begins. This is simply leftover space. The blank space after Daniel occurs at the end of the Old Testament portion of the Codex. There is simply no more Old Testament text to write. And it would be remarkable to start the Gospel of Matthew with anything other than a fresh folio. So, the blank space after Mark 16.8 in Codex Vaticanus is not a byproduct of factors that were naturally involved in the production of the Codex. It was left blank intentionally. This is an example of memorial space, blank space that was left to show that at this point in the text, the copyist recollected a reading that was not in the exemplar that he was copying. When verses 9 through 20 are written in the copyist handwriting, beginning immediately after Mark 16, 8, and the letters are slightly compressed, all 12 verses fit into this blank space. This very strongly indicates that the copyist of Vaticanus was aware of the existence of verses 9 through 20. So in Codex Vaticanus, we have support for the text without verses 9 through 20, and support for the recollection of the text with verses 9 through 20. Codex Sinaiticus also has some highly unusual features involving the end of Mark. The four pages of the Codex that contain Mark 14, 54 to 16, 8, and Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 56, are written on a cancel sheet. The text on these four pages of text was not written by the same copyist who wrote the text on the pages that appear before them and after them in the manuscript. These four pages were produced by the proofreader of the manuscript, probably the diorthotes, or the supervisor, when the manuscript was still in production. This individual detected something in the main copyist work on these pages that led him to remove and replace the pages that had been made by the main copyist. And we don't have the pages that were made by the main copyist, so we can't see exactly what elicited the removal, but we can observe what was done on the replacement pages. Before engaging in a little detective work to deduce why the scribe did what he did, let's see what he did. The individual who made the replacement pages wrote the first three columns normally, with about 630 to 650 characters in each column. But in column four, his lettering is drastically compressed. This column contains a little more than 700 letters, far more than the usual rate. On the next page, the lettering is stretched out, averaging a little less than 600 letters in each column. As the copyist of the replacement pages was writing Mark 16.1, he accidentally skipped most of the verse, and as a result, he had only 589 letters left of Mark to write when he began column 9 at the beginning of the third page. Now, normally, 589 letters would easily fit within a column, but instead of ending Mark in column 9, the individual making the replacement pages stretched out his lettering more drastically than before. As a result, column 9 contains only 552 letters. The remaining 37 letters were written at the top of column 10. And after the end of Mark 16.8, an, an especially emphatic decorative design fills the rest of the line and also fills the following line, which is unusual. This is followed by the closing title, and the rest of the column is blank. Now, contrary to what some commentators have claimed, it is not unusual in Codex Sinaiticus to have blank space like this below the closing title. Every book begins at the top of a column. The text of Luke begins at the top of column 11. In every column of the cancel sheet that contains text from Luke, the lettering is significantly compressed. 
instead of seeing 630 to 650 letters per line, here we see columns with 685, 672, 702, 687, 725, and 679 letters. This is remarkable variation. It implies that the pages made by the main copyist displayed a large omission of text, probably a skip from the beginning of Luke 134 to the beginning of Luke 138. The individual who made the replacement pages needed to fit Mark 1454 to 168 and Luke 11 to 56 into 16 columns with about 311 letters included that the main copyist had failed to include. And now for a little detective work. After the authority has calculated that he could fit the text of Luke 1, 1 through 56 into six columns of compressed lettering, he wrote those six columns of text on the replacement pages as columns 11 through 16. Then he went back to column 1 and began to write the text of Mark 1454 to 168, resuming his normal rate of letters per column. But in column 4, he reverted to compressed lettering. We don't know why. Did he momentarily consider including Mark 16, 9 through 20? Again, we don't know. But if he had continued to compress his lettering in the next six columns, as drastically as he does in column four, he would have been able to include verses 9 through 20 with room to spare. Six columns of 700 letters each would provide room for 4,200 letters. Mark 15, 17 through 16, 8, as written on the cancel sheets, consists of the of 2,982 letters. Add on the 971 letters in Mark 16, 9 through 20, and you only have 3,953 letters. You could even throw in the 80 letters that were skipped in Mark 16, 1, and still have plenty of room before reaching the end of column 10. However, it seems unlikely that the individual who made the replacement pages would use an exemplar different from the one that was used by the main copyist. More probably, in column 4, the person making the replacement pages inattentively reverted to the letter compression that he had been using in Luke. When he reached the end of the page, he realized what he had done, and so he began to stretch out his lettering. After accidentally omitting most of Mark 16.1, he needed to stretch it out uh, even more drastically. He even wrote Jesus' name out in full in verse 6. Thus, he had 37 letters to put at the top of column 10. What this shows is that the individual who wrote the text on these replacement pages in Codex Sinaiticus made a special effort to avoid leaving a blank column after Mark 16.8. He also added a distinctly emphatic decoration after verse 8. Meanwhile, as I mentioned, something in the neighborhood of 1,640 manuscripts include Mark 16.9-20, or include at least some of these 12 verses showing that all 12 verses were on the page when the manuscripts were in pristine condition. These include the Uncial Manuscripts Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Ephraim Scriptus, Codex Sigma, also known as the Rosanna Gospels, Codex Beze, Codex Basiliensis, Codex Sedilianus, Codex Cyprius, Codex Campianus, Codex Nanianus, Codex Washingtonianus, Codex Delta, Codex Macedonianus, and more. In addition, Mark 16, 9-20 is a reading for Ascension Day and is the third reading in the Heothena series in hundreds of Greek Gospels lectionaries. Now, included in those 1,640 Greek manuscripts that include verses 9 through 20, are about 15 manuscripts that have special notes about the passage. These manuscripts fall into two main groups, the cluster of manuscripts known as Family One, and a group of manuscripts that feature what is known as the Jerusalem Colophon. Ministerial 199, which is related to Codex Lambda, has a short note in the side margin beside verse 9 that says, in some of the copies... This does not appear, but it stops here, that is, at the end of verse 8. In the upper margin, uh, verses 9 through 20 are designated as the third reading in the Resurrection series and as a reading for Ascension Day. Ministrials 20, 215, and 300, which have the Jerusalem Colophon, have a longer note in the margin at or near Mark 69. It says, From here to the end forms no part of the text in some of the copies, but in the ancient ones it all appears intact. Ministrials 1, 1582, 209, 205, and 2886, a very close relative of 205, are all members of Family 1, and each one has a note that says, Now in some of the copies, the evangelist work is finished here, and so does Eusebius Pimphilius' canon list. 
but in many, this also appears. Minuscules 15, 22, 1110, 1192, and 1210 repeat most of that note, but do not mention the Eusebian canons. Their form of the note only says, in some of the copies, the gospel is completed here, but in many, this also appears. Fifteen copyists did not write these notes spontaneously and independently. They are echoing an earlier source. The witnesses that have this note fall into distinct groups. And Bruce Metzger described the testimony of this, these, this very small group of manuscripts by saying, Not a few manuscripts which contain the passage have scribal notes stating that older Greek copies lack it. That's not exactly what those notes say. Two forms of the note state that some copies don't have verses 9 to 20, but many, many do have verses 9 to 20. And manuscripts 20, 2, 15, and 300 say explicitly that this section of text is all there in the ancient copies. Metzger also stated, in other witnesses, the passage is marked with asterisk or oboli, the conventional signs used by copyists to indicate a spurious addition to a document. This tends to convey a misimpression, as if there are Greek manuscripts in which Mark 16, 9-20 is accompanied in the margin by nothing but asterisk or oboli. In real life, there are manuscripts that use marks to draw the reader's attention to comments in the margin, and where such marks exist, they typically draw the reader's attention to part of the catena markum. That is the case, for instance, in minuscule 2812, the, Z the Zelata Gospels. But Dan Wallace claimed in 2007 that a scribe might simply place an asterisk or obelisk in the margin, indicating doubt about these verses, and he listed five manuscripts as examples, 138, 264, 1221, 2346, and 2812. Well, looking at each of these, I discovered the following. Minuscule 138 is an annotated manuscript. It has material from the Catina Markham on the same page. Minuscule 264 has an asterisk in the margin alongside Mark 169. However, in the upper margin, it also has the title of the lection that begins at Mark 69. An asterisk appears in 264 alongside Mark 1112. And in the upper margin, there is the title of the lection that begins there. An asterisk, appear, an asterisk appears at Luke 18.2 and at Luke 19.29, and at Mark 14.2, and in each case, in the upper margin, there is the title of the lection that begins at that point. These asterisks are clearly not text-critically relevant. They are connected to the lectionary apparatus and have nothing to do with the expression of doubt about the passages where they appear. In minuscule 1221, there is no asterisk before Mark 16.9, the mark that appears there, a cluster of four dots, appears at other places in the manuscript. On some nearby places, it can be seen in Luke 124, before Luke 126, before Luke 157, at the beginning of Luke 2.1, at the beginning of Luke 2.52, at the beginning of Luke 3.1, etc. These marks clearly were not intended to convey doubt. In minuscule 2346, there is no asterisk. A cluster of four dots appears before Mark 69, and at the top of the page, the title for the lection is written, Resurrection Reading Number 3. The same symbol appears at John 1.43 and John 2.12. Its purpose is not to express doubt, but simply to separate one lection from another. All five of Wallace's examples are phantoms. In addition, just to wrap up loose ends, it should be mentioned that minuscule 137, which is sometimes listed as if it has asterisk alongside verses 9-20, is a manuscript in which the text of Mark is framed by commentary material, and the commentary includes the same extract from the Catina Markham that appears in 2812, appealing to a cherished Palestinian exemplar of Mark to vindicate the inclusion of verses 9 through 20. So unless someone has other evidence to submit, the claim that has been spread by Wallace, by Evans, by Wright, and many others about asterisks appearing alongside Mark 16, 9 through 20 as expressions of doubt about the passage, ought to be retracted the sooner the better. There is no such thing as a non-annotated Greek manuscript of Mark in which Mark 16, 9-20 is accompanied by text critically significant asterisks or oboli. Another part of the evidence that has experienced a high level of misrepresentation is the patristic evidence. Two statements from Bruce Metzger's textual commentary on the Greek New Testament have been repeated by many other commentators. First, the statement, Clement of Alexandria and Origen show no knowledge of the existence of these verses. 
Uh, those who encountered this statement might conclude that these two writers' non-use of Mark 16 and 20 implies that the passage was not in their copies of the Gospel of Mark. But Clement barely made any use, or rather, any, any clear quotations from the Gospel of Mark outside of chapter 10. Similarly, Origen does not use a 54-verse segment of text in Mark 1, 36 through 316, or a 28-verse segment in Mark 3, 19 through 4, 11 or a 41-verse segment of text in Mark 5, 2 to 5, 43. If Origen did not quote from Mark 16, 19 20, then those 12 verses are just one of many 12-verse segments of Mark from which Origen does not quote. However, there is a passage in Origen's composition, Philokalia, uh, chapter 5, that may be based on Mark 16, 15 through 20. Second, uh, Metzger stated that Eusebius and Jerome attest that the passage was absent from almost all Greek copies of Mark known to them. This statement needs major clarification, especially because it has been misrepresented by some commentators. Ben Witherington III erroneously stated, Eusebius and Jerome both tell us that these verses were absent from all Greek copies known to them. In real life, in the composition Ad Marinum, Eusebius responds to a question from Marinus about how Matthew 28 2 can be harmonized with Mark 16.9. Matthew says that Christ arose late on the Sabbath, but Mark says early in the morning on the first day of the week. Well, already we can see that Marinus' text of Mark, just as old as Eusebius' testimony, included Mark 16, 9-20. Eusebius, in response, mentions two ways to, to resolve the apparent discrepancy. First, a person could say that the relevant passage is not found in all copies of the Gospel according to Mark, and that the text in the accurate copies ends at the end of verse 8. Almost all copies of the Gospel of Mark end there. That is what one person might say, rejecting the passage and rendering the question superfluous. But, Eusebius continued, another view is that both passages should be accepted. It is not the job of faithful readers to pick and choose between them. So he continues, granting that this second perspective is correct, the proper thing to do is interpret the meaning of the passage. If we draw a distinction in the wording, we would not find it in conflict with the words in Matthew's account. We should read the words in Mark, rising early in the morning on the first day of the week, with a pause after rising, for that refers to Christ's resurrection. The rest, early in the morning on the first day of the week, pertains to the time of his appearance to Mary Magdalene. Three things must be noticed whenever Eusebius' testimony is mentioned. First, he does not frame the statement about manuscripts as his own observation. He frames it as something that someone might say. Second, instead of advising Marinus to reject the passage, Eusebius recommends that he should retain the passage, and he even tells him how to pronounce the passage so as to make it clear that it is in harmony with the passage in Matthew 28. And third, Eusebius himself quoted Mark 16.9 further along in the same composition. Once he states that some copies of Mark say that Jesus had cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene, and once he says that Jesus cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene according to Mark. It should also be pointed out that nobody, in the decades after the Diocletian persecution, had the means to survey how many manuscripts existed throughout the Roman Empire to support this or that reading. What about Jerome? It should first be acknowledged that Jerome included Mark 16, 9-20 in the Vulgate Gospels, which he specifically stated that he prepared on the basis of ancient Greek manuscripts. Now, Jerome himself was born in the mid-300s, so we may reckon that these Greek manuscripts were older than that. Again, Metzger's statement is, Eusebius and Jerome attest that the passage was absent from almost all Greek copies of Mark known to them. Let's test that. The relevant statement from Jerome is found in his composition Ad Hedibium, from about the year 407, in which, among other things, he responds to a broad question about harmonization difficulties in the resurrection accounts in the Gospels. In the course of his response, he breaks down the question into a series of questions and answers clearly patterned on Eusebius' earlier work to Marinus. Jerome, like Eusebius, says that there are two ways to resolve the question. Jerome, like Eusebius, says that one way is to reject the passage in Mark on the grounds that it is absent in nearly all of the Greek copies, and because it seems to narrate things that contradict the other accounts. And Jerome goes on to say that Matthew and Mark have both told the truth and that when the text is read with a pause after Jesus arising, before, on the first day of the week, in the morning, appeared to Mary Magdalene, the difficulty goes away. 
Jerome is plainly instructing Hedibia to retain the verses. Now, this is how D.C. Parker explained the situation in 1997. Jerome's letter to Hedibia is simply a translation with some slight changes of what Eusebius had written. It is thus worthless for our purposes. And Parker concluded, Jerome is no evidence for the short ending. Now, John Bergen had said basically the same thing over a hundred years ago. Jerome was saving time and effort by condensing part of Eusebius' earlier composition in his letter to Hedibia, just as he had acknowledged in his Epistle 75 that he sometimes dictated to his secretary what he had borrowed from other writers. But this is not all. In Against the Pelagians, about the year 417, Jerome pictured a champion of orthodoxy explaining where he had seen the interpolation that is now known as the Freer Logion. He located this interpolation in certain exemplars, and especially in Greek codices, near the end of the Gospel of Mark. And then he quoted almost all of Mark 16.14, and then presents this interpolation. How is it that Jerome says the Freer Logion was seen after Mark 16.14, especially in Greek codices, and also says that almost all Greek codices lack Mark 16.9-20. Well, the explanation is that the first statement is drawn from his own experience, while the second statement is extracted from, is extracted from Eusebius' composition in which it was framed as something that someone might say. Now I turn to some patristic evidence from the era of the Roman Empire. These will be described fairly briefly in the interest of brevity. In every case, uh, see my book for more details. Epistula Apostolorum, from about the year 150, echoes the narrative flow of events as recorded in Mark 16, 9 20. In this text, and in Mark 16, 9 through 11, the disciples are depicted disbelieving a woman's report that she has seen Jesus. Justin Martyr, in 1st Apology, chapter 45, in the course of interpreting Psalm 110, makes a strong allusion to Mark 16.20, blended with Luke 24.52. He refers to how, G how the apostles went forth from Jerusalem, preaching everywhere, using three words that appear close together in Mark 16.20. And in chapter 50 of First Apology, Justin alludes to the scene in Mark 16.14, using the phrase, and later, when he had risen from the dead and was seen by them. Tatian, in about the year 170, incorporated Mark 16, 9 through 20 into his Diatessaron, a text in which all four Gospels were blended together into one continuous narrative. This is attested in Codex Faldensis in Latin and in the Arabic Diatessaron, which was translated from Syriac. Irenaeus, in about the year 180, states in Book 3 of Against Heresies, in the 10th chapter, toward the conclusion of his Gospel, Mark says, So then, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, and sits on the right hand of God. This is confirmed in a Greek margin note in manuscripts 1582 and 72, alongside Mark 1619. The note says, Irenaeus, who lived near the time of the apostles, cites this from Mark in the third book of his work against heresies. Now, having listed four witnesses from the 100s over a century earlier than the earliest manuscript evidence for the ending in 16.8, I will list some others. Tertullian, in his Apology, chapter 21, writes that after Jesus rose from the dead, afterwards having commissioned them, that is, the, apostles, the disciples, to the duty of preaching throughout the world, he was taken up into heaven, enveloped in a cloud. And in Scorpiasse, chapter 15, Tertullian appears to use Mark 16, 18 in an allegorical way. Hippolytus, around the year 235, says something similar in Apostolic Tradition 32. Let every one of the believers be sure to partake of communion before he eats anything else. For if he partakes with faith, even if something deadly were given to him, after this it cannot hurt him. Now this part of apostolic tradition is extant in Greek. Hippolytus' term for something deadly is thanasimon, exactly the term that appears in Mark 16, 18. Hippolytus may also be the source of material that was blended into other material that formed Book 8 of Apostolic Constitutions. There we find this extensive quotation. With good reason did he say to all of us together, when we were perfected concerning those gifts that were given from him by the Spirit, Now these signs shall follow those who have believed. In my name they shall cast out demons, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they happen to drink any deadly thing, it shall by no means hurt them.
They shall lay hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. These gifts were first bestowed on us, the apostles, when we were about to preach the gospel to every creature. Now, no matter how you slice it, Apostolic Constitutions itself is a text from 380, practically contemporary with the scribes of Codex Sinaiticus. The Didascalia from the early 200s in chapter 20 echoes Mark 16, 15 through 16. To everyone, therefore, who believes and is baptized, his former sins have been forgiven. And in chapter 23, the apostles are pictured saying, We were gone forth among the Gentiles into all the world to preach the word. Vincent of Thiberus at the Seventh Council of Carthage in 256 stated, We have assuredly the rule of truth which the Lord, by his divine precept, commanded to his apostles, saying, Go ye, lay on hands in my name, expel demons. The author of De Baptismate in 258 echoes the scene in Mark 16:14, describing how Jesus rebuked and reproached the apostles for their unbelief. The CY form of the Old Latin chapter summaries is called CY because it is assigned to the time of Cyprian or a little later. The last chapter summary for Mark is number 74, wherein he appeared to all the apostles after his resurrection. The Hierocles in the year 305 was a pagan writer, trained by an earlier pagan writer named Porphyry, whose writings he recycled in his own work. It is probably Hierocles' composition, Truth Loving Words, that was quoted around 405 by a writer named Macarius Magnes in Apocriticus. Macarius Magnes was unaware of the identity of the author of this book. One of the excerpts that he quoted include, includes the following challenge. Consider in detail that other passage where he says, Such signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands upon sick folk, and they shall recover. And if they drink any deadly drug, it shall in no wise hurt them. So the right thing would be for those selected for the priesthood, and particularly those who lay claim to the bishop's or president's office, to make use of this form of test. The deadly drug should be set before them in order that the man who receives no harm from the drinking of it might be given precedence above the rest. And if they're not bold enough to accept this sort of test, they ought to confess they don't believe in the things Jesus said. That was Hierocles. Aphrahat, a Syrian writer who knew the Diatessaron, used Mark 16, 16 through 18 in the 17th paragraph of Demonstration 1 on faith in the year 336. When our Lord gave the sacrament of baptism to his apostles, he said to them, Whoever believes and is baptized shall live, and whoever believes not shall be condemned. And at the end of the same paragraph, Ephrates said that Jesus said, This shall be the sign for those who believe. They shall speak with new tongues, and shall cast out demons, and they shall place their hands upon the sick, and they shall be made whole. Acts of Pilate, from the early 300s, also known as the Gospel of Nicodemus in a later expanded form, includes a utilization of Mark 16, 15 through 16. Two characters in chapter 14 report that they saw Jesus after his resurrection, sitting on a mountain with his disciples, saying, Go into all the world and preach unto every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who disbelieves shall be condemned. Now let's take a closer look at the Freologion. This extra material appears in Codex W after Mark 16, 14. And this is what it says. And they excused themselves, saying, This age of lawlessness and unbelief is under Satan, who through the unclean spirits does not allow the truth and the power of God to be understood. So then reveal your righteousness now. Thus they spoke to Christ. And Christ told them, The years of the reign of Satan are fulfilled, but other terrors approach. And for those who have sinned, I was delivered to death, that they might return to the truth and sin no more so that in heaven they may inherit the spiritual and incorruptible glory of righteousness. Of righteousness. But, and then the text continues with uh, verse 15. Although there are a few minor differences between this Greek text and the Latin text that Jerome described as something that was seen especially in Greek codices, it is clearly the same material. Therefore, it must have been in some Greek copies before the time of Jerome. Metzger goes further and states, it is probably the work of a second or third century scribe, in which case it is yet another witness earlier than the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus for the surrounding verses. Fortunatianus, a Latin-speaking bishop in northern Italy in the mid-300s, wrote the earliest Latin commentary on the Gospels, and in it he states that 
it is fitting to connect Mark with the symbol of the eagle, because Mark demonstrated that Jesus ascended to heaven. Ambrose of Milan, in about the year 385, repeatedly quotes from Mark 16, 9-20. Repeatedly. One example in Of the Christian Faith, section 86, is particularly interesting. He says, We have heard the passage read where the Lord says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. This shows that in Ambrose's time and place, Mark 16, 9-20 was read in the church services. Ephraim, a Syriac bishop in the city of Edessa, around 360, wrote a commentary on Tatian's Diatessaron, and in his commentary he mentioned that after Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus commanded his disciples, Go out into the whole world and proclaim my gospel to the whole of creation, and baptize all the Gentiles. Epiphanius, writing in the late 300s on the island of Cyprus, wrote in Medicine Chest, As the Gospel of Mark and the other evangelists put it, and he ascended up to heaven and sat at the right hand of the Father. Augustine, writing On the Soul in about the year 400, used Mark 16.18 as he explained that cautious reading of heretical books allegorically fulfilled the promise that believers will not be harmed by the poisons of heresy. He also quoted Mark 16.15 in 4th homily on 1st John to the Parthians. Augustine's Greek manuscripts were mentioned by him in Harmony of the Gospels, chapters 34, excuse me, chapters 20, 24 and 25, where in addition to commenting on Mark 16, 16.9-20 in detail, he refers to a detail in Mark 16.12 and says, In the Greek codices, indeed, the reading which we discover is estate rather than country seat. And in what are called the Lucian Acts, L-E-U-C-I-A-N, uh, the story of John the son of Zebedee features clear utilizations of Mark 16, 15 through 16. Macarius Magnes, already mentioned as the author of Apocriticus, demonstrates that Mark 16, 9 through 20 was in his own copies. The Doctrine of Adai, which reached its extant form in the early 400s, has the character Adai saying, We were commanded to preach his gospel to the whole creation, thus echoing Mark 16, 15. Pelagius, in a comment on 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, in his Expositions of 13 Epistles of St. Paul, cited Mark 16, 17 in a distinctly non-Vulgate form. Philostorgius, in around 425, mentions an episode that was regarded as an example of the fulfillment of the salvation-bringing gospel saying, and they will pick up snakes with their hands, and if they eat anything deadly, it will not harm them. Esnik of Golb, one of the Armenian scholars who took part in the revision of the Armenian translation of the Bible in the 400s, used the contents of Mark 16, 17 through 18. Prosper of Aquitaine quoted Mark 16, 15 through 16, and stated that it was according to Mark. Marius Mercator, writing in around the year 430, used bits of Mark 16, 16 and 16, 20, from an old Latin text in Sermon 10. Marcus Eremita, writing in about 4, 435, quoted Mark 16:18 at the end of chapter 6 of his Greek composition against Nestorius. And speaking of Nestorius, Nestorius, as cited by Cyril of, Alexand Cyril of Alexandria around the year 440, made a clear quotation of Mark 16:20. Peter Chrysologus, Bishop of Ravenna from 433 to 450, commented extensively on Mark 16:14-20 in his 83rd sermon. St. Patrick, in Ireland, in the mid-400s, used Mark 16.16 in his letter to Corticus, and he quoted Mark 16.15-16 in chapter 40 of Confession. A few other witnesses that illustrate the wide scope of the support for the passage may also be mentioned. These include the Gothic Codex Argentius, the Curatonian Syriac, the life of St. Samson of Dole, Old Latin Codex Corbiensis II, identified as FF2 or Old Latin number 8 in the Buran identification system, the martyrdom of St. Eustathius of Mazzecetha, the book of the enthronement of the Archangel Michael, early copies of the Peshitta Gospels, the text called Revelation of the Magi, a Nubrian prologue to a hymn, a Coptic homily on the Domitian of Mary attributed to Cyril of Jerusalem, and a wall inscription in Old Dongola in what is now Sudan. That should give some idea of the extent of the external evidence that favors Mark 16, 9 through 20. It is extremely ancient, it is extremely abundant, and it is extremely diverse. 
But there is another ending called the shorter ending that is yet to be considered. God willing, in the next lecture, we will look at the evidence for the shorter ending and also consider the internal evidence. In closing, for documentation of the evidence I have described today, see my book Authentic, the case for Mark 16 and 20. For details on the testimony of Eusebius of Caesarea, see Roger Pierce's book, Eusebius of Caesarea, Gospel Problems and Solutions. And for details about the testimony of Fortunatianus, see the English translation of Fortunatianus' commentary by Hugh Calton in association with Lucas J. Dwarfbauer. Thank you.